This is Senior Master Coordinator Bob Ferguson, and it's my very, very great pleasure to have Sarah Scherer on with us. He let me read the bio so that I get it right. As a registered dietitian, licensed nutritionist, and a two-time Team USA Olympian and Olympic finalist, Sarah's passion is motivating people to be the best version of themselves, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. She joined Shackley as the Shackley Pure Performance Team dietitian slash nutritionist. Pretty wonderful. Through her own coaching practice at sarahelijahsharer.com, and we'll put that in the, in the notes. We'll put that in, in the Facebook groups and everything. And with other programs, uh, she has coached over a thousand individuals toward weight loss, diabetes prevention, heart health, healthy aging, smoking cessation, improved sports performance, and other goals. And finally, she has an MBA with a specialty in healthcare management. So Sarah, great to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Bob. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. It's a great evening. Is everybody having a good evening, I hope? <laughs> yes, I'm sure. It's, it's plenty cold here. It's, 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 it's nice and cold in Iowa. It was, it, we, we were greeted to zero degrees. Oh, my goodness. None, none whatsoever. <laughs> no degrees. <laughs> <laughs> I was sharing with Bob a little bit before this that uh, I, so I am in currently in Dallas right now, but um, I originally came, come from Montana. So I know the cold, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you, you guys are really real cold. I understand. Yep. Yeah, we, yeah. We have an increment form of cold, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Jared, what we had advertised to all these wonderful people is we're going to talk about becoming the best version of ourselves. So. Uh -huh. Let's talk about that, but before, yeah. let's get a, little, get a little bit of your background as an athlete, what you accomplished yeah. as an Olympian, and yeah. then how you found Team Shackley, Shackley Pure Performance Team. Love it. I love it. Yes. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, so let's go. Awesome. Yeah, so a little bit about my background. Um, it actually kind of starts a long time ago. The, I would say... When I was about 11 or so, 11 or 13 years old, um, in that time frame, I actually had my own personal struggle with health. And I was a, uh, a young athlete. Again, I was just 11, 13-ish. I had just had a couple years already competing in my sport. I started um, rifle shooting was my sport. I started when I was in about nine years old. And so I was able to have a couple years out of my belt, but then I ran into some health problems. And I had all these different doctors tell me different things. I had um, doctors tell me, oh, it's just, you know, chronic migraines. You're going to have those for the rest of your life. Um, or, you know, you're going to have this pain, da, 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 da. It just is what it is. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, all the symptoms, everything I was experiencing, the nerve pain, the migraines, and so forth, kept getting worse and worse and worse. It hit a point where um, I was around 16, because it was, yeah, it was about 16 or so, because I was in the middle of high school. Um, I hit a max where I was having migraines, and I was having hand tremors. Every, every single day, I had a migraine for about three months straight. Oh, my goodness. Completely <laughs> debilitating. I didn't leave the house. If anybody knows who what, if they had migraines, they know, oh. you know, light sensitivity, the nausea, everything else. Um, and my doctors, they didn't have any answers for me except to take a medication that would have 100%, no, ex no exemptions allowed, disqualified me from competing in my sport at any level. So at the kind of cusp, at 16 years old, I was, you know, again, getting pretty good. I ended up being actually in, in when I was 17 is when I made the national team. Um, and so I was almost national team level. And my doctors told me, you either have to, you know, take this medication and there's no more sports in your life. And you also have to be prescribed this for the rest of your life. Um, or you're going to have to deal with tremors and migraines for the rest. Um, and my, my little joke there, as I would tell my doctors, is like, it doesn't really make sense for a rifle shooter to have tremors because <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, supposed yeah, to be yeah, very yeah, still. Really <laughs> <bad thing. laughs> exactly. It's like one of the worst. Um, and so along this, this journey of health, I decided this doesn't work for me. I, I'm not willing to be prescribed a medication for the rest of my life starting at 16. And so I did so much research. I took a look at my nutrition. I took a look at the chemicals and everything else in my life. I looked to take a look at all the different triggers um, for my health, for the things that we're experiencing. 
And I actually started doing that with a health journal, which I tell you that now because we'll talk about that in, here in a second. Uh -huh. um, but I started taking notes about my experience in it, what my body was feeling and what, again, what my environment was, what my nutrition and exercise, hydration, all that stuff. And I found lots of interesting, fancy, you know, fascinating things about my body, but most importantly, I learned how critical nutrition was to prevent the symptoms that I was having. Um, I was able to get to a point where, again, I wasn't having migraines every single day. Um, at that time, they got down to about a, a once a month or so, which was revolutionary in my life. And just through nutrition and exercise, and again, adapting healthy behaviors for my body. Um, and then, like I told you guys earlier, at 17, I made my national team and I've, you know, competed um, for the national team for all the years up until making the college team. So I, um, in the rifle shooting sports is a collegiate um, sport as well. So I got to compete at the NCAA level. We actually had two national championships under uh, the years that I was there, which was awesome. So we we're NCAA national championship. And um, then we were able to, during my college year, I made my first Olympic team. And so that was 2012 and that was London. And all during that course of my life, I had to be very keen on what I was putting my body through. Um, and so having a really rigorous training schedule and academic schedule and everything else, my nutrition always played a really key role as well as stress management and sleep, hydration, all the things. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later too. Um, and so then in that entire course of things, I decided I wanted to become a registered dietitian because I was like, how perfect is that? <laughs> I've already done all this self-study, might as well get a degree out of it. Exactly. And so I became an RD and that's uh, kind of where I found nutrition as well as, you know, nutrition finding me and, and really providing the life for me and, and being able to be free from burden, the burden of health and the bur burden of health issues. And um, so then that, again, brought me to be an RD. After college, I made my 2016 Olympic team, and that was my last Olympic team. And since then, I have been um, pursuing doing a lot of different stuff in health coaching. And I really, you know, like Bob was saying earlier, I love helping people understand their understand their body, understand how they could be the best version of themselves, and also being being free from health burden. I know how that felt. I know how it felt to have a doctor's diagnosis that there was no you were stuck, you know, and I want anybody that I work with. And, and that's kind of, you know, my, my platform is you deserve to have a life that you don't feel burdened by your health. And there are choices and there are sacrifices that you might have to make, but they're worth it because you only got one body and it's worth it to feel great every day. <clears throat> yeah. That analogy that you uh, made about when we build a house. Yes. It's all elaborate. So talk, talk about that. What, what's, what's, what's the relationship? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So Bob and I were just talking a little bit about build, building a house. And I was thinking, I was really, you know, one thing I've, I've struggled with is the culture that we have around health in our, in our lifestyle. I actually told Bob as well, there's this, I have a client that I worked with that, um, whose friends, you know, friends around their, their, um, you know, close friends, family, whatever, they were beginning to have, beginning to make healthy habit changes. So this client of mine was beginning to eat better, beginning to make changes in how they even like purchased and organized their kitchen and everything else, you know, how they purchased food and their pantry and did a whole refresh. Um, they even like moved and joined a different gym. And so they were changing all these different elements of their lifestyle. And their friends and family were like, "Doesn't isn't that extreme? You're you're making all these sacrifices." And and um, they went mostly vegetarian as well. And their friends were like, "That's that's just extreme. Like that doesn't seem like that's worth it." And the the one of my client, you know, he's he came back and he said, "I was talking to my cardiologist, and the cardiologist told me what is extreme is having to cut somebody's heart open and tear it all the way open." and doing all that, you know, pumping them full of blood so they don't die, you know, closing it all up, they have a scar from here to here, you know, that's extreme. What isn't extreme is healthy lifestyle. And it's about making those sacrifices. And yes, sometimes there are some sacrifices to have a healthy lifestyle, but it's worth it. And, and that's what, when, you know, Bob and I were talking about building a house, 
you know, we go through all of these processes to build a house, you know, the planning, um, you know, we take out a loan, right? We make a sacrifices in our budget leading up so then we can even afford the house. Then we hire the experts, you know, we hire the architect and the builders and we lay a solid foundation, right? All these elements we go through to just build a house, yet we think it's extreme to adopt healthy behaviors and to make little sacrifices along the way. And we don't think of building a healthy life from a solid foundation and all the way through. And uh, we, need to, we need to change that mindset because we do need to build, build healthy lifestyles. It does take work, but it's worth it. Absolutely. Well, great. And so yeah. how did you find Jacqueline? How did you find the Pure Performance team? Yeah, so um, it's kind of a complicated story, um, but one thing that um, you all might have heard of Eli Bremer, maybe a little bit. <laughs> he's yeah, he's yeah. very usually very well known in the Shaggy world. And so he actually, um, of course, being an Olympian himself, um, he and I connected and we actually were beginning to talk a little bit about our passions for nutrition. And I told him I, you know, I'd been doing Shackley for a long time. And I told him, I was like, hey, I love what you're doing for Shackley. This is so cool. I'm an RD myself. And so I'm just like giving him the thumbs up of just congratulating him for, for pursuing his passion and affecting people's lives. And then he comes back with, huh, you're an RD. You're an Olympian. You love Shackley. Maybe we should have you come on board. <laughs> so it was a funny, you know, story, but it was really meant to be. And uh, I've been loving my time um, being more involved with the Shackley family. And I was able to go to conference. I hope there were some other conferencers uh, yes. in, in call here. It was so much fun. Bob, were you there for a conference? I was at the conference and I also saw you in Chicago. Remember? When yes, that, yes. Yeah, yeah, Chicago is fun too. Met, uh, met formally for the first time. Yep. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So yes, it's been wonderful. And it's really been a great avenue for me to, you know, share again, my passion for, for health and, and my passion for how critical nutrition is as one of those foundational pieces for our body. And then also elimination of toxins, you know, everything from the, the youth products and the cleaning products on the Shackley line. I've used them every single day because for me and my body, and this is, goes for everybody's body, it's so critical to have the right stuff on your skin and in your environment, as well as what you take nutritionally. That's great. We were listening to a uh, webinar with Bruce Daggy, Dr. Bruce Daggy. Mm -hmm. He said, basically, it breaks down to three things, or two things, only two things. Number one, reduce the toxins yep. coming in. Number two, optimize the ratio of calories to nutrients. Yep. That's, if, I love that. If people did that, you know, it's, it's a very simple way of understanding it, isn't it? It's kind of fascinating. It is. It is. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and that second point is, is so key. Um, we, we so overly get wrapped up in calories. Oh, we got to, you know, get rid of our calories or this thing has this many calories. It's like, it's not about that as much as nutrient density. And that's what exactly he's talking about is, is the ratio of the nutrients to the number of calories in there. And when we choose everything that has more nutrient density for the calories. And for instance, life shakes, I love my life shakes because again, it's such high quality nutrition for the calories, but at the same time, I'm gonna be full, I'm gonna be happy, I'm gonna have energy, all the things that are gonna make me feel great because it's that high nutrition content. And, and, and in such a pleasant package. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, use, I use Francis Dickey's Radiant Stary Jersey Milk, grass-fed. Yes, and yep. three scoops, a scoop of a scoop of uh, the old uh, performance. Uh, Bill yep. Plus, Bill Plus, a, yep. scoop, a scoop of the of the chocolate, a scoop of the fresh vanilla. Yes, peaches that I that I froze from last summer, and a Yum. half a cup of berries. Oh, I, oh, it's just like yeah. heavenly nutrition. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yep, yeah. Um, I actually recently had one of my friends begin to start taking life shakes and he told me, he's like, I've tried every other life, you know, every other protein shake out there or meal replacement out there. He's like, I couldn't even tolerate them. He's like, and these are delicious. I love them. <laughs> it's like, yay. It's really hard to get people to consistently use, consistently use something that really tastes awful. Right. Exactly. 
Yeah. Very good. So let, let's let's get into the end of the meat of it. Uh, you've got a really wonderful uh, way of, of organizing our thinking about this. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah. Do you want me to share my screen? Sure, please. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So I was I was telling Bob. Um, the one thing I wanted to share today and kind of go over um, was this idea of, of health journaling. And, you know, being the best version of ourselves um, is a great concept. And, and it's, you know, in the moment, it's this big idea. And then there might be a million things that pop into your head when it comes to what that means for you. Um, and so, you know, go through my athletic career and through my experiences, one thing I realized is that journaling is a really, really powerful tool for us to understand different elements about who we are as well as our, what our past has been and where we wanna go for the future. Um, I, use the, I use journaling every day in my sports career as well as, like I told you guys earlier, um, in my health journey. And it was such a critical piece for me to begin to understand my body, understand what it needed um, and be able to establish that I don't need to, you know, be stuck in this rut of what my doctors were saying. You know, I could through, um, through nutrition, through exercise and everything else, um, really change my, my health for the better. So these are kind of the ideas that, um, I found really powerful in my journaling. And this is one of the things that I coach with, um, the clients that I work with is establishing some patterns around health journaling. And I encourage all of my clients to begin a health journal. And Bob, actually I can, uh, if, I don't know if it's a good, an option for you, but I can definitely like put together a PDF if anybody wants to like print it off or anything like that. Um, if anybody else, you know, if you wanna have it on your website or whatever, I can. Absolutely. Please okay. send the PDF and I will attach it to a bunch of the Facebook groups and I can turn, okay. it, into a, um, turn it into an image that I can actually post, uh, okay. post also. So that's great. Sure. Yeah. Please. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. I'm a printing, printing out person myself. So. <laughs> it's that tactile. tactile yeah. Exactly. Right? Right. yeah. yeah. Um, and so we had already talked like I said, a little bit about this idea of, you know, rebuilding a house and what that looks like. Um, and so, you know, what I encourage each of us to do is as we begin health journaling is ask yourself, what future, what house do you want to build, right? What is the future house in your head when you're thinking of those different qualities about your health you want? Is it a, a life and a, and a house that, um, you know, has maybe a big, big room and it for exercise, right? You want exercise to be a big part of your life. Um, maybe it's specifically yoga. Maybe it's one of my personal favorites, getting outside and exercising. Um, my husband and I just started actually um, trying cross-country skiing. It is so much fun. If anybody hasn't tried it, I recommend it. It's it's oh, yeah. a blast. And um, so again, you know, thinking of what are the rooms you want in the house? How do you want them to work together, right? Um, and that it's a, it's a nice visual for you to, again, capitalize on the concept of building versus assuming it's going to happen, right? It does take strategy. It does take some planning. And it allows you, when you plan it out, it allows you to think through how how much is this, is, is this worth for me? You know, you visualize the good, you visual, visualize all these positive things in your life and you, it come, you, what comes just naturally from that process is how valuable that is. It might be a little bit down the road. You know, building a house doesn't take a day, right? Building a house takes some time, but each step along the way, as you build and build and build, it gets closer and closer to that fruition. Um, then another thing, that I like to, you know, think about is motivation versus determination. Okay. Mm. Um, so of course we all know motivation is powerful. It really is. There's nothing like that, you know, we, maybe our first, um, the first thing when we were a child, we really, really wanted, maybe it was a toy, you know, maybe it was, um, some something in your life where you're like, I, I want to learn how to do that. Maybe it's riding bicycle. You know, there's always a lot of emotion packed in that. And that motivation drove you to accomplish whatever that was, right? Or achieve that or learn that um, and whatnot. 
And so motivation is very powerful and it can be very emotional, but it can be fleeting. That's a problem with it. We can't always control whether or not we're motivated to, to do something, especially if it's really far in the future. You know, if we're thinking at, um, you know, we're thinking now in our health and we, we don't maybe have any health issues, maybe our cholesterol is healthy, but at the same time, we want to think toward our future. We want to say, we still need to think, what do we want that future house to look like? And we can't just say, if I continue unhealthy patterns or whatever the patterns are, that we're going to get there. We can't assume that. And so motivation takes a back burner when it often comes to our long-term goals. And that's where I always say we need to rely on our determination. And that's a multiple step process, but ultimately determination is something you can control. You can't control whether or not you're motivated all the time, right? It's emotion, it's fleeting, but you can determine, you or I like to say, decide in your determination, decide your determination that you want to have and to accomplish that. And so a couple of things that you can do to create that determination and then also create motivation as well and create more of those emotions behind that goal that you want to set is to follow. Uh, there's a model called the GROW model. It's actually um, developed by Sir John Whitmore. It's used a lot in business concepts and a lot of different things. Um, but I really like it when we think about goal set and we think about wanting good things to happen in our life, whether it's in our health or life, to be able to use this GROW model. Um, so the G in GROW stands for establish the goal. I personally always recommend setting goals that are SMART. Of course, that's an acronym. The five characteristics to a goal that is typically going to be a lot more motivating and going to be easier to achieve through your determination is going to be one that's specific. And that means you want it to be something that isn't, I want improved health later on in life. So vague, nothing to work on, right? It's just, it's so non-specific. There's nothing that you can actually work toward. Um, so you, again, you want something critical. For instance, in my health, um, one thing that I routinely work on actively is, um, again, some of the migraine stuff. So I know that I want to have a lifestyle that is free of migraines. So I have to be very specific about what I do every single day and the patterns that I choose, my sleep, and again, all those other things. And I'm very specific about what's going to lead to the goal of having migraines, no migraines for the rest of my life. Measurable, also measurable. Um, so for instance, back to the migraine um, idea. So thinking through water. We all know hydration is so important. So my measurable element from my water goal is I want to at least drink 46 hour, you know, ounces of just pure water and I drink other stuff too um, to get to about my 64 ounces of liquid per day. That's something that my body needs and of course that fluctuates depending on what environment I'm in, hot, you know, humid, cold, etc. Um, but again it's measurable. It's something that I can work to achieve. Then it's also something attainable. If we begin setting goals and we set a really high bar for ourselves that's way above what we're doing, we're going to get frustrated. We're going to get burnout and we're just going to feel bad. You know, we're going to, we're going to beat ourselves up because we didn't attain that goal. So we want it to be a very reasonable, attainable goal, something that is just a slight improvement from what we're doing. And as you set a slight improvement and you complete that goal time and time and time again, you'll get there a lot more quickly than if you set a really high goal. And then again, um, you know, realistic, similar kind of a standpoint. Um, the also the other word, um, you know, I like to add in there is something reasonable. <laughs> you know, if you can reason through it and you can say, okay, logically I could accomplish it. There's not a million things in my way, then it's, it's a good one to set. And then the final one is going to be time bound. So having it be under a specific course of time, again, back to the hydration, right? In my course of my day, I want it to be um, my 64 ounces of total liquid, 48-ish, 45, depending on what my humidity level is. Does that make sense? Okay, 
Then the next piece of the, um, the GROW model is the current reality. So the R is the reality. In your health journal, what I recommend to ask yourself is what is the current situation? It's so important to understand where we are coming from. Um, the other questions you can ask yourself that I absolutely love is what are the qualities about yourself and what are the resources around you? Just like building a house, right? What are the resources? What are the experts that you're going to pull in to support you in your goal? Um, finally, understanding obstacles. So, so important. Um, being able to explore options and solutions is the next step. So I like to say brainstorming is fantastic but we need to avoid groupthink. Now groupthink is something we can so typically get wrapped into because it's the culture around us. It might be a family member, it might be friends, it might be your coworkers, right? There's, there's people around you that think a certain way about, our, about the health and about the idea of health and whatnot. And we need to make sure that we are establishing what, what of those perspectives do we not uh, want to align with so say when we begin to adopt a healthy behavior, we don't share that with them and they come back and say, you're crazy <laughs> or that's too much of a sacrifice or whatnot. Again, avoiding the group think and it's great to brainstorm with folks. It's great to have the support team around you, but you wanna make sure that there's people that are gonna support you. And again, many more questions that you can ask yourself. Um, one of the things that I, I brought up a little bit earlier is sacrifices. Now, sacrifices, again, when you are thinking of building the house, you're going to sacrifice certain elements. Um, my husband and I just bought a house, actually, our first house in our marriage, um, my first house I ever bought, as we've almost had it a year, about a year now. And the amount of time, right, sacrifice, time number one, the amount of the down payment, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much money, <laughs> right? You're signing a check off to the loan office and you're like, are you sure I can sign this check? Is that like, is that fine, right? So there's all these, you know, there's, there's a lot of emotion that comes with it. There's a lot of things you might sacrifice to be able to plan for something better in the future. Um, but it again, it's worth it. And it is important to recognize those sacrifices too um, and celebrate them being sacrifice and you moving on to a different stage in your life. And the final one is establishing the will. Um, and so this is where will, motivation, and determination can kind of align and meet, meet each other. Um, committing to specific actions is, again, the determination. But then when you are moving towards the goal, when you commit to those specific actions, you complete them and you're moving toward that goal, that's when the motivation is going to kick in. So determination, more has to be first. Will kind of has to be first. But then as you accomplish those goals and you begin to see the payoff and you begin to feel amazing, that's when you're going to be like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I love this. I can't wait to do more. And that motivation will kick in. Um, all the time I talk to my clients and maybe they haven't exercised in a very long time in their lifestyle and they begin exercising the first week, two week, maybe three weeks, they're miserable. I'm like, just push through. I promise you, I promise you, right? Use your determination, lean on your will. You can, you got this. And then come three weeks and beyond, they're feeling amazing and they, they don't want to stop. They're motivated every single time they go to the gym or they complete that exercise, they feel great and they want to keep doing it again. Um, and that's where it gets easier. I like to think of also a pendulum, right? Or not, maybe not a pendulum, a seesaw maybe, right? So if, if I'm the center of the seesaw here and we have the choices over here we're making that are unhealthy and the choices over here that, that are healthy and we slowly move them over, then it's going to get easier and easier and easier and easier to make those choices over time. Okay. How are we doing on time, Bob? We're doing great. Just keep rolling. We're, okay. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, good, good. Feel free to jump on in anytime. Well, and if there's actually, a actually I might I might ask one question. Please. Now, when you're you started at rifle shooting at what age? Nine. Nine. At what time did the inkling, little inkling of a thought come? I wonder if I could be in the Olympics. <laughs> Do you recall yeah. when that might have happened? 
Yeah, it was, it was actually during high school. It was a little bit later. Um, I went to the, the, uh, a competition called the Junior Olympics, which is, it's not an Olympic world level. It's actually just a national level thing that we just call it the Junior Olympics. Um, and I went to that for the first time when I was 13, I think I was 13. And um, when I made that competition, it, they actually host it at the Olympic Training Center in oh, Colorado yeah. Springs. Okay, um, yeah. And so that was the first time that maybe, maybe I got that inkling of um, not, not that I could do it, but that this is an option, that this is really cool. This is really exciting. Um, I want to pursue this sport because I think there's so many great things about this sport and the great opportunities. I don't, I don't remember thinking that I'm going to, you know, I want to do this at the Olympics. That was a bit later. Um, and one of the reasons for that was my health. I, I actually, you know, had quite a few years there where I thought my health was going to stop me. Um, Cause that's what I kept hearing from the doctors. Um, and so it, it took some time for me to really settle in and decide, no, this is something that I can do. I, no matter what the obstacles are, I can find solutions to them and I can, and can, I can do this. Um, so I would say that I was probably mid high school ish when I was um, getting better and I was competing stronger. And a huge part of that was my, was my understanding of my health and being able to prevent these symptoms from happening. Um, I remember I had a competition um, and it was one of my, my first like world, um, you know, kind of world cups and everything else. And I was probably half the age of my competitors <laughs> on the average. And I remember, com you know, competing in that and being terrified and nervous and everything else. At the same time, I was thinking, he's like, it is, it is something very special that I get to travel to another country, get to meet people from all the different parts of the world. And we get to share a passion for something. We get to share a, a passion for a sport that is so unique, um, but being able to connect on that level. And that's really a key part when I fell in love another time with the sport. And I was like, I want to do this for as long as I can. And um, I really want to, you know, pursue the, the excellence and really get to the, the high level for this sport as well. So well, and that was- I guess to that point, um, yeah. the relationship between that mental process, which is subtle, because mm -hmm. when you first started to have the inkling of maybe not thinking about going to Link Olympics, but this is cool, you were a long ways away from being able to shoot at the Olympics, right? Like light years. Away. Light years. <laughs> light years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was that inkling which developed into the raging, you know, mm -hmm. desire. Yeah. But then you employ the smart goals. I think a lot of times people don't necessarily um, take into account the value of dreaming. Mm. And you had that brainstorm, you yeah. know, what could happen? Mm -hmm. But giving full expression to that because it's only the dreams that you would use the SMART goals to, why employ a SMART goal if you don't have a big goal? Right. Because SMART goals are always little incremental things, right? You get them, you get them, and you get them, you get them. So I, that was just something that occurred to me that, um, yeah. and you, so, so let, let's, why, why don't we translate that into uh, our health arena? Because yes, yeah. we, can spend smart, some, we can set SMART goals and we can do this and that, but what is it about what can we do to really drive us into the future and what, and make us give us the will and determination to employ those smart goals? Yeah. How do we do that? Yeah. One of the most powerful tools for that is visualization. I love the power that it has of walking yourself through your life and what you want it to be a year down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. You know, I, I'm not a mom yet. You know, my husband and I, we might, we might go down that road yet, but you know, one thing that we've, we've talked about is like, what kind of parents we want to be. And, and I have walked through the whole experience of, I want to be healthy 
and at a point where I'm agile and active, where my five-year-old is running down the, you know, running down to the yard or whatever, and I can chase after them. You know, I'm I'm strong and I'm limber and everything that comes with having that lifestyle. And so visualizing, like you said, dreaming, thinking forward into the future and saying, what? Maybe it's a big, maybe it's a big thing. Maybe it's bigger than you could even think right now and it's almost like insurmountable right now but it's dream and then break it down into the processes break it down to how you can get there um, and so i would say visualization is, is one of the most powerful tools um, as well as you know getting people around you that also believe in you and believe in your goals um, there's nothing like having somebody come alongside you in life and work toward those goals together um, you know that's that's something that I've, I've heard when it comes to marriage, right? I'm sure <laughs> other, other people in here, you know, building a strong marriage, right? Um, and, and even just having, you know, I, one thing I love about my husband is he is very honoring of me in my health perspective, you know, and he's there to support me along the way. And even, it doesn't have to be somebody as close as, as your husband. It could be, you know, any friend or family, and even just re learning how to connect with people in the world who are aligned with you is so powerful. And I promise you, if somebody else out, if you're looking for somebody to support Nicole, there's somebody else out there that's looking to support their goals too. And you guys can do that together. Um, and that can be any, any person. It's just about finding that friend and so forth that can support you. Super. Absolutely. Yeah. Super. Yeah. That, that's so important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And when it comes to, um, you know, thinking of thinking through coaching, right? The coaching process. I, that's one model. I think I love about Shackley is the fact that most of us, we come to Shackley because we love people <laughs> and we love being able to share our passions at the same time as help other people, you know, have accomplished their, their goals, whether that's financial freedom or health or whatever it is. And um, I think all of us in Shackley are kind of coaches. <laughs> yes. You know, we all love that. No, so, so it's a great it's a great group. I promise you, there's lots of shack of people that are support you in your health goals. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about today um, is talking about like how to begin a healthy habit, and there are three components. Do you want me to jump into that, Bob? Yeah, please, please. Okay. So thinking through the habits in a very, very small concept is gonna be the best way that you want to start. And this goes with not just health habits, but all habits. You know, we think about brushing our teeth. At some, at one point in our life, we didn't brush our teeth. At one point in our life, our mom or our dad or whomever was our caregiver had to tell you, no bro, brush your teeth. I remember, oh my gosh, I'm so, I was such a terrible child. Um, my mom had to, I let's see, it was a mix. It was like a certain ratio of bumble gum, bubble gum, like toothpaste and mint toothpaste. And they had to be in the perfect amounts together. There couldn't be too much bubble gum or too much mint. And I had to look at them on my little toothbrush and it, oh my gosh, I was such a terrible child. Anyway, <laughs> but the reason, right, I bring that up is because it wasn't a part of my habit. I had to have the perfect split between my bubble gum and my mint for me to be motivated to brush my teeth. But here we are, right? We all brush our teeth because we formed it into a habit. There was a simple, you know, a simple three thing, three step to follow. Ultimately, the first one is starting with a cue. So some type of trigger, some type of cue that tells your body, tells your brain, whatever it is, say for instance, you know, go to the restroom, right? There's a cue that we physically feel to go to the restroom. In the same way, it might be a thought that, you know, we're getting ready for um, maybe we're about to go hop in our car, we do the checklist, right? Do we have our keys? Do we have our cell phone? Do we turn the lights off? Do we lock the doors, right? So there's a cue in action that happens. Um, and the other thing that is really important to think about as we're starting new habits is how we can establish those cues and those reminders in our life at, at the get-go. So everything from, I'm a big, you know, like I said, 
printing out papers type of person. So I love post-it notes myself, um, but there are so many other ways to do it. You can set reminders. Um, there's nothing like having a Fitbit, wearing a Fitbit to tell you to get up and move and get some activity. Um, setting a calendar appointments. One thing that I recommend with my clients is setting an appointment, a health appointment for yourself every day. Um, even, if it's, even if it can't be health every day, once a week, literally setting a 15 minute appointment in your schedule where it's blocked off. It's not penciled in where you can erase it. It's penned in or permanently in there where you can commit to, you know, whether it's health journaling, even just doing some mindfulness, drinking some water, going for a walk, whatever it may be for you. Um, setting an appointment for your health, again, establishes that you're building new elements of your future into what your house is going to look like. Um, and then following the cue up with the action you want to take. And I liked this. I, I really focus on this word immediately. It's very easy for us to fall into habits of, I'll do this in five minutes. I'll do this in an hour. I'll do this tomorrow. And that's when it, it's very easy to give ourselves excuses and, our, and reasons to not do a new habit we're starting. So I say, commit to doing it immediately. And also start with something that's gonna be really simple and really easy to do in a couple minutes or so, you know, just like brushing the teeth. Um, when you do it immediately, again, it's a stronger, it's a stronger establishment, establishment of that pattern when it comes to your lifestyle. And then the final one is establishing a reward. So I personally find it the most motivating rewards are something that's tangible, something that you can even put around you that you can see for future, right? So, you know, maybe it's, um, let me think of a good example from my life. Um, oh, okay. I really like hats. Um, so I collect all sorts of strange hats. I have like, I don't know, 50 hats. It's kind of ridiculous, <laughs> but I love hats and I have them all, you know, set up in my um, bedroom and in my office. And one thing I've done in my lifestyle is when I reach some type of a milestone, I will let myself go buy the hat. So weird. I don't know. Quirky me. But at the same time, it's something tangible and physical that I have that also gives me future reward for that. You know, I look at my, you know, such and such chat and I'm like, I remember earning that. And again, it inspires me for more. Um, again, something emotional, something personal, like strange hat addictions. <laughs> That's a very benign, strange addiction. True. It is true. There could be worse things, right? <laughs> um, so those, again, those three things. Have a cue or a trigger that starts. Then follow with up the action immediately. And then establishing a reward, having a pattern in there. And when we begin to do these things, it gets a lot easier to begin to start habits. What do you think about that, Bob? Have you done that before? It, it sounds great. Well, I, I don't know. I, I was I wasn't going to share this, but I will. I, I have a minor I have a minor goal, uh, and it's okay. a vision of myself because I, like uh, I was a wrestler and and all that uh, yep. when I was in high school, and you could do a lot of things. Like mm -hmm. I could uh, get up to the top of the gym, the roof of the gym, on a rope without my legs in like six, seven, six seconds, seven seconds. Now, fast forward 52 years, it's 52 years later, and I've got a, I've got a picture of yep. me going to the gym. Oh, I love it. Jumping on that rope and hand over handing, no, no legs, and touching the, touching the ceiling of the gym. Yeah. So that motivates me. It motivates me to do my, my routine every day. And you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's who, awesome. who knows, who knows what, what, it, uh, what motivates us, but just yep. a picture of that. Yeah. Who knows if I'll ever do it, but it, it, it's motivating as heck to even think about it. It is. Yes. Yeah. And, and just like you were, you're describing all of those emotions, right? And the experience and you, you can, you're actually walking yourself through the joy of being able to get to the top and like, you know, touching it and or ringing the bell or whatever it may be. Yeah. I can, I, I can feel, I can feel yeah. the texture of the rope. I can yeah. smell it because you're yeah. basically, 
I, I can feel it. I can, I can feel the rope touching my legs as they go up. And it's, yeah. just, it's great. It is. Yep, exactly. And like I said, it's inspiring you to continue to pursue the, the elements of your body and your health and your strength, and everything else that's going to lead to that goal. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That was cool. <laughs> that's much better than my hat one. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Hey, hats are cool too. <laughs> and what's the big deal about climbing a rope at a gym? But I mean, it's kind of whatever, whatever, whatever does it for, for our insides, right? Yes, exactly. Yep. No, awesome, awesome. Um, I was going to actually ask um, the folks, and I don't know if we can share in chat here, um, but what were what are some things that you, maybe you've used as a reward in the past, and maybe we can just you know again brainstorming with each other, right? It's nothing like sharing ideas for each other of what we we are inspired by. Um, there's also some really great resources if anybody wants to you know, they can't think of a reward is just looking up self-care ideas. Just Google that. There are hundreds of resources out there of different things you can do, um, like getting a massage or, you know, whatever kind of treat that you deserve um, after that hard work and you, you reach that goal. Um, so, and so Nadia, yeah. Nadia points out that the power of habit is a great tool, uh, the, yes. the power of habit. Yeah. If there's anyone else who has even if it's kind of funny or slightly embarrassing, like my getting up the rope without my legs. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, you got, you got, sometimes you just got to put it out there. Exactly. Uh, who else has, uh, you can just type it, pop, pop up the little chat bubble in the bottom. And if you've got something that motivates you, whether it's in exercise or it's in diet or it's in some other area of life, you know, what, how do we connect? Okay, so Jeff and Sue Lambden says, in college, used to play an LP once I'd completed a research task of paper. Today, it may be a special cookie or a snowshoe in the woods with our puppies. Yes, I love that. I love that. Yep, snowshoeing is so much fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I had a, we had an epic snowshoe. I was like two winters ago with, uh, Lambdens have about a thousand acres behind their house. Oh, that's of, awesome. Of state forest. And there's, yeah. oh. And, oh my God, it's everything. So okay. So, so is cross country skiing. Good. Who else, who else has a motivating habit before we uh, go into the health checklist? Well, Sarah, so here we are. We had what happens often in live theater. We had the barking dog effect. <laughs> so, right about the time we finished, uh, you had a wonderful little doggy there started to bark, and yeah. we soldiered through it. But it was kind of hard to hard to listen to. So what we're going to do now is have you share your screen, and we're going to go over the health check-in list, and then we'll finish up. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for meeting with me again because I felt so bad with the dog barking. It was a loud dog. <laughs> She's very sweet but loud. <laughs> okay, so one thing that I think is so valuable for each person to do on a regular basis is to complete a health check-in with themselves. Um, so I put down a kind of a list of some, some questions that you can start with. Um, but first off, you know, back when we were talking um, a little bit earlier in the presentation was about setting reminders and some type of cue or trigger for yourself to be able to integrate a little bit more health awareness into your lifestyle. And so a great way is to just set a personal appointment for yourself, make sure it's penned in, not penciled, penned in, and you commit to that time and do a check-in. doesn't necessarily have to be following these questions. It could be doing some mindfulness, going for a walk, um, you know, doing something you enjoy, something that's going to be healthy and good for your body as a whole. Um, but if you wanted to do a health check-in, these would be some questions to start off with, a great way to realign your values with what your priorities are in your life and to think a little bit more deeply in our health so we can build that healthy house. So to start off, a great question to ask yourself is, what choices did you make this week that built health into your life? Um, then on the other side, what were some of the choices that tore down health in your life? Again, understanding there are, there are some sacrifices that we need to make sometimes, and there are some choices or behaviors and things that are actually tearing down our health. And it's important to understand what those are and think through, are those important to still be in my life? Or over time, should I integrate more of the things and, and make more things healthy in your life and take away some of the things that are tearing down? Um, and then another one, is about the body and our health and our self-talk. It's so valuable to understand how, how much our thoughts affect 
what we do. What we think is what we act, right? Um, and so it's so critical to work through how we are talking about our health. How are we talking about our bodies? Are we having a positive, uh, you know, interaction in our mind with our body or is it negative is it um you know we don't want to step on the scale because it there's always emotion or maybe some negative emotion with that you know and then we can maybe go down a path of, of beating ourselves up right so it's really important to understand that when we talk positively about ourselves and about our health and and not in just like, oh, pat on our back, we can do whatever we want, but more on the context of we're improving our health. I know, I believe in my power to change my health and so forth. That's gonna be very impactful for your body and for your long-term. Um, you know, right here, it might be yeah. interesting to uh, talk, uh, just like we did with Amanda Elmore. This whole idea of self-talk and our internal yeah. picture is so critical. And the yeah. more high-performance situation we're in, the more critical it is. We can kind of move along in life in a routine way and not pay much attention to our self-talk. But if we, if we really want to achieve something greater, then we really want to pay attention to it. And for those who think this, self-talk, talk to myself, you're thinking this, talk to myself, no, I don't talk to myself. <laughs> You know, it's, right. we all talk to ourselves. We all talk to ourselves, yes. Fact, it's so ingrained that we don't, can't even hear ourselves talk. So yeah. I actually love these questions. Mm -hmm. Bringing yep. the self-talk to awareness because otherwise that mental chatter is so intimate to us that we can't, mm -hmm. we don't even know we're doing it. We don't even right. know we're talking to ourselves until we yep. realize, oh yeah, we are, I am talking to myself. And yep. if I am talking to myself, what should that talk look like? So how did you use that in your athletic career? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and there's a lot to that answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of well, course, yeah. right? Kind of but since we're redoing a piece of the thing, why not? Right, exactly. No, I love it. It's a great question. And, you know, a lot of, so it, one part of my, um, you know, athletic experience was my struggle with health. And so I had to be really critical about making sure that I spoke to the frustrations that I was experiencing in my health and talk to myself in a positive way because it sometimes did hold me back from athletic performance. And so I could have very easily fallen into the pattern of beating my body up mentally, you know, and causing more stress and more negativity if I had taken that route. So I had to be very self-critical and critical meaning in the way of like self-analytical, not negative critical. Yeah, analytical, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and being able to process the things that I was experiencing and the frustrations that I was having, but in a way where I knew that this, this is the full picture and what the, the experiences that I was having with my body and, and some of the negativity was at the same time helping me grow. At the same time, when we have experiences, we have frustrations, maybe our body isn't the place we want it to be. Instead of beating ourselves up about it, think, okay, this is helping me learn. This is helping me improve. This is helping me become a full, well-rounded person. And also thinking through how much that experience that you're having of, of maybe frustration and, and self-talk um, can be a great way to share that with others, right? We, we all have our own challenges, but we also can share our challenges with others and help inspire them. Um, to change what they want to change. And so, you know, I kind of took that, that avenue with it, you know, to answer your question, Bob, because I was very, I, I definitely had some struggles with it. And I had to be very, very keen on keeping a close eye on my self-talk. And that way allowed me to actually come to each performance and perform in my top and know that there might've been some frustrations along the way. And that's okay, that's part of life's journey. And uh, we got to press forward and think positively because then positive things come. You know, let's just, spend one more minute on that because yeah. I think what a lot of people feel emotionally yeah. when they confront their self-talk, yeah. it may be that they feel sufficiently uncomfortable that they don't want to hear that self-talk. So they push it away or they don't mind it. They don't pay attention to it. So it's running all the time. Yep. So many times when I've talked to people about that, well, they say, but yeah, but it's, it's if, I, if I talk to myself in the way I want to be or see myself in the future, it's not really true. I am sick. My body is sick. I am overweight. I look at the mirror. I don't like what I see. So a lot of times people feel like, well, 
I don't want to feel that way or I don't want to lie to myself. Mm. So you, you actually did tell us the, the technique and process. Well, let's go, let's go over that again. If you're in yeah. a situation that you don't want, that isn't comfortable for you, you want to change it. How do you recognize the current reality and at the same time move your awareness into a picture of what you want so you're not stuck on that picture that you then gravitate to, right? If you yeah. say, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. Well, the body says, okay, we'll be sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or we'll yeah. be overweight or we'll be out of shape or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think you brought up a really key point about thinking and, and being aware of what the reality is, but also then thinking what the potential future we can control and change is. And, and being able to separate the two. You know, our reality and things we can't control it's actually very healthy to write those down, you know, process what those things are. You know, maybe, maybe it's some of our genetic makeup, right? We, we do get cards that are dealt to us that are genetic makeup. At the same time, that is a, actually a very small bucket of our health, right? We have this large, vast bucket of really things that we can control. And so, you know, even no matter if it's health or any other situation is really breaking those two apart. What is the reality of what we can't control? And that's just something we have to come to terms with. And then that, then that almost frees you up to think of all the space of things we can control and the things we can have an impact on. And granted, it might not be overnight and that's okay, but it's worth it because it's about giving yourself the freedom and you're really giving yourself that, some of that power back, right? Putting yourself back in the driver's seat and saying, you know what? I'm not going to keep, you know, driving all over the place, getting lost. I'm going to follow a path and I'm going to go through this direction that I'm going to say in my own head and then follow through with actions, goals, accountability and everything else. Um, so it's, I would say start there. The other piece of it is at the same time is giving your, writing your own story of what your self-talk you want it to be. It, it doesn't come naturally sometimes and that's okay. It doesn't have to, but actually writing down a story of this is what I want to say to myself. This is what I want to when I'm thinking of the flow of thoughts that come throughout your, your whole day, this is what I want it to be about and reaffirming those moments when you do think that, and then even like having a mantra, you know, having things around either post, like I said, I like post-it notes, right? <laughs> uh, but maybe if it's some other type of affirming quotes, messages, you know, encouraging messages, messages to yourself, right? There's nothing like having a letter to yourself, like in your phone, and you can read it when you start going down that negative self-talk path and it brings you right back to home and aligns you back to a positive note. Yeah, it's such a beautiful thing. And uh, my mom was a master at this. Mm. And she passed at age 95. And the last year of her life was not all that mm. comfortable. Yeah. Uh, she decided that being in a wheelchair in the house was better than falling down. Mm. And so she was in a wheelchair. And, you know, she was, fortunately, mentally, she wasn't limited. But physically, she was pretty limited. Mm. So here's how she handled it. She goes, well, at this point in my life, I can't do this and this and this, but wow, I can do this and this and this and this. And that's how she maintained her positive attitude and looking forward to the things that she could do. So yeah. this really works at all levels of life where we're when we're young and we're moving into our life and then at the end of life if you want to be happy we control our self-talk we decide what it is that we're going to tell ourselves and tell the world and how we are going to be and we live into that right yep yep exactly that, that's a great example that's a beautiful story of, of your mom and um you know that's a great testament where she said she took a situation that you could in in, in all reality be frustrated about it, but at the same time, you know, she was able to find the space for her to, to continue to live life and, and joyously. So that's awesome. Great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're on the la last two, right? Last two points. Yes. Um, so, and then thinking, you know, a little bit more back to the SMART goals, right? A little bit more back to a um, actionable item. So thinking in the next week, especially if you're doing this on a weekly, you know, a weekly basis, checking your results, I recommend you know, thinking, okay, next week, what do I want to continue for your health? It's so important to give yourself that positive 
rep, you know, um, affirmation of what you're already doing, you know, make a list and just, and every single one that you are adding up, it just, you know, what I like to say is like, you think about putting on, you know, celebrating, whatever, how are you going to celebrate? You know, I, I kind of think of, it's kind of weird, but like putting on a little crown, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> but I visualize it no, and I visualize it through. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Who knows? Right. Quirky Sarah. We've already, we've already, you know, understand that Sarah's quirky. Um, but you know, whatever you visualize is give yourself that positive affirmation of that hard work. Cause it was hard work and that is going to make it easier. It's going to motivate you to continue with those healthy behaviors. Um, and then the other side of it is thinking about what you want to cease. So again, what are those things that are taking away from your health? What do you want to do differently next week? Start simple, start, you know, start something that is, you know, not, not five things at once, start simple, something that's really talent, tangible and is actually something that is an improvement, but not overboard. You know, maybe for instance, you love that you went walking for the first time, you know, and in your, maybe in your neighborhood or whatever, you went walking at lunch for the first time, you know, during your week. Fantastic. Put on that crown, celebrate it. <laughs> and then think, okay, you know, next week, if do I want to see something, maybe, um, maybe a good example is like maybe ceasing always going and having dessert after a dinner or something like that. Um, and so thinking, okay, maybe I'm just going to have dessert on the weekends and just cease throughout the rest of the week, right? Still, it's something that's smaller than what you were doing, but it's not saying, Hey, I can't do dessert for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's not going to be something that you can commit to and um, continue. So again, start small and uh, yeah. Check in. It's so valuable to do that check, health check in with yourself. Wow, Sarah. Well, this has really been a fantastic thing. Maybe we can stop uh, screen share so we can be together sure. for a bit and then uh, we can finish up. So yeah, what a fantastic thing. Well, I'm really glad that dog barked because <laughs> we, we've created something that was different and, and yeah. more expansive, I think, than, than what we had yeah. before. So. Everything, it's all worked out, right? <laughs> everything, everything always works out. So, you know what I look forward to is maybe in another three or four months, something like that, we can have you on again and we can drill down more specifically into how the Shackley products have worked in your life and how yeah. you've seen them yeah. augment a really good, clean, wonderful diet. And again, just continue on this theme of. Mm -hmm. How do we use all these tools that we have, yep. mental tools and physical tools and exercise tools and nutrition tools, so that we really can live the most full life we possibly yeah. can? Yep. I love it. Yes. I would love to come back. And I'm so happy you had me on call. It was very fun chatting with you. Well, it's so great. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of months. Sounds great. Bye, Bob. Bye, all.